What an interesting time for the ISS to fly over. Right now. something. That might not have been the ISS. Yeah. That was a little garbagey. Oh, you're not going to see it because it's uh, all green screened out. I told you to stop! No! Oh, you bastard. I keep hitting stop, but you keep going start again. I lost it. <laughs> We're just going to let that go in the background because we got a lot to talk about today and not nearly enough time. <laughs> so anyway, that was the ISS. I should probably pause this. We got a lot to talk about for the ISS too. So we'll pause that for a second. If I see that signal bounce up again, that we're going to have a live queue. So, so I'm going to wait for people to get in right now because I, I noticed the last couple of times. Last time I had, you know, I had Jerry on and I was trying to be quick to get to him. But we're going to go slow Just start out with the beer. I got the 7th anniversary now for the Fig Mountain. I figured the 6th was so good. Got to go with the 7th. And while we're talking about the ISS, I want to remind everybody. We got the Facebook group. We got the Ham Radio Crash Course. And we also have the Discord. Now, on the Facebook group, if you go join that, which you're welcome to, free to join. There's just a couple dumb questions. Feel free to answer them any way you want. I only get a little cagey when people don't answer the questions. If the answer is you don't have your license yet, that's okay. And if the answer is you don't know what a ham is, that's okay too. Make it up. Be, be something funny. Uh, anyway, take our 7-3 glass here. Anyway, the Discord chat, as, as well as we're going to have a live chat after the stream, um, I want to mention that I will also be doing it, well, I'm not, in part of the people that are on Discord. We're doing a um, SSTV contest for the rest of this week. The ISS, what you just heard, is sending out um, SSTV digital tone on 145.800. I should probably get rid of this uh, net since we're not going to be having the net today. Bye bye net. So yeah, if you uh, if you go to actually, let me let me just switch on over here. So here's the link to Discord. It's in the chat. And this is the text for our little contest that's going on. Dominic is running it with a couple of different discords. So super cool. <laughs> and basically what you need to do is you use a website like n2yo.com and it'll tell you the passes, the upcoming passes for the ISS. We just had a 40 degree pass. It was pretty good. It, was, it sounded really good. Now, there's a lot of things you can do um, to get the ISS better. You can go watch my uh, stream from two weekends ago, the one where I was talking about the satellites and making your own Yagi uh, tape measure thing. So that's cool. You can also get this little recorder, connect that to your, uh, or hook it up next to your radio and receive off of that. All things you can do. Don't want to belabor that. There's videos for that. You can go check that out. Uh, let's see. How many people have we got in the chat right now? 57 people. If you're in the chat, give me a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate that. Plus, we've got a lot of people in here, so let me let me take a quick troll of the chat room. Get my pop-out chat going. All right. We've got a lot of people in here before. Um... That was very cool. Someone needs to make an SSTV alarm clock. Yeah, that was pretty cool that that just happened to be, like, right there waiting and going. Yeah, I have a 17-foot... Um, MFJ antenna on the roof, so it's got like a 12 dB gain on um, 70 centimeters. A little less on two, but still, that, that gets her done. All right. Uh, isn't it short for near to you? Short to near to you? Yeah, near to you. ISIS is fake. Earth is flat. Radio waves would go off space instead of going into the world. Sure. Why not? Why not? Okay, so let's let's take a dip into this Fig Mountain because I got an unboxing to do too. Got so much to do today. I hope you guys are buckled up. Man, 
Uh, I didn't. So one, we're doing a general class license testing, getting that going today. We're gonna do the introduction, chapter one and two, basically. That's the goal anyway. If we can, we can get to it. Woo. Okay. All right. Fig Mountain, anniversary seven. Imperial Porter, very uh, campfirey. There's actually pictures of marshmallows and chocolate squares and grains. Very smoky. Ooh, very smoky for, well, it's a porter, so. Whew. All right. So everybody's popping in right now. Thanks for the help, Josh. Past technician last week. KE0RDH. KE0RDH is pretty pretty decent on the CW. The H would probably be the longest thing. Let's get that general. Yeah. Get the Lewins HD1 if you have a DMR radio. The RT82 is good, too, by Redivis, the one that I reviewed. Uh, N6DWA here. Just heard the ISS. Yep. Hit the thumb. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for hitting the thumbs up. I really appreciate that. So I've got an unboxing. Or an unbagging. An unbagging. Oh, wow. Look at that. Here, let me switch over so you can see it. A little envelope. Just a little envelope. A little envelope. Because what's in here is pretty tiny. Uh, I got a contact. Somebody started talking to me on the um, on the Twitters. I gig this open a little bit, so don't be upset. Uh, let's see. Is there anything in here? Ooh, 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 ooh. I don't want to spoil this. So, okay. Here's the package. All right. <laughs> Look at this. Come on. Keychain QRP in 20 meters. He's got them for 40 and I think 80. And what this does is it hooks up to a 9 volt battery. It's got an SMA plug on the side. It's got a port there for speaker out. And then it's got a tiny key. Now I was told that I could use a VHF UHF antenna if I don't hold down too long, I ask, because I was like, how are we going to make, how are we going to test this, show this on air? So I'm going to do that right now. I've got a speaker. Actually, I don't need a speaker. I don't need a speaker at all. What am I talking about? Because I'm not, I'm, I'm transmitting. So I'm transmitting into this. So let's see. Can I, oh, that's not going to work. Hold on. I need another one. Whoa, six, six dollars and sixty six. Oh, sense. Thank you so much, Toys R for Boys. So yeah, uh, Baofeng antenna to the rescue. So I'm going to turn to... All right, I'm getting on the... Uh, 14-4-7-50. Right? Okay. One four seven fifty. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my nine volt battery, and I'm gonna connect it here. It's there. <laughs> okay, so if you're interested in this, it's the quirky QRP keychain. Uh, he is on Twitter. In fact, let me let me switch over here. He's at uh, quirky QRP, and uh, and you can get your your QRP keychain. <laughs> he said he was gonna send me one of these for me to check it out, and it's super cool, super cool. Look at this. It just goes on your, uh, it, I'm going to put this on my badge. I'm going to put this on my badge and I'm going to take it to work. I wonder if I'll get kicked out of the labs. They'll probably kill me. That is cool. Thank you, James. That's, <laughs> that was fun. All right. I like that. I did not think that was going to work as well as it did. That was terrific. I, of course I did have to get a little closer to radio, but no big deal. Okay. All right. What else do I need to talk about? I don't want to forget because Okay, uh, Discord after chat covered that ISS very cool. We heard that, so that's awesome. No better way to do it than that. Okay, without further ado, so uh, lots to talk about. 
get your general class license. Yeah, ISS is overhead in Florida right now. Yeah, just record it with your phone. Just record it with anything you get your hands on. Um, do it that way. It's going to be great. And then run it through uh, an SSTV app, like on your phone, will work great. That's actually what I did. And I have the audio too, which uh, I should just turn this thing off because we're done. That's fine. Just passed uh, tech an hour ago, Mike W. Well, awesome, dude. Okay, so general, we're going to, so a couple of things. I'm going to jump and forth, back and forth between the slides that you're looking at and then the HF radio and the VHF radio because I want to kind of show you what I'm talking about. The first couple of chapters are general introduction into general HF radio. Actually, HF radio. It's just the general license. So here we go. So what I did, um, in fact, let me let me jump ahead a little bit so I, so I can make sure. So I got the uh, general class manual here. A double R L version that has the spiral bound. This is a really nice book. The link is in on my Amazon YouTube page or Amazon page here in the description. And um, for the price, it's pretty good. I like that it's spiral bound and it lies flat, so you can highlight and you can flip it over and you can do all that good stuff. But um, the last time we did the technician book, I was scared that I'd be stepping on uh, Gordon West toes. And he does make a good book, and I and I recommend everybody go get it. But I got the AWRL book, and I was reading through it, and I saw this passage that says, AWRL general class license manual can you use either by an individual student studying on his or her own, own or as part of a licensed class taught by an instructor. I'm the instructor. You're the class. This is the ham radio crash course. So we're going to use um, some images that I took from the book. These are just snippets to kind of help me walk through it as we go. Um, you're going to be able to follow along a lot better if you get the book, though, because you're going to be able to get all the context. So, okay, that out of the way. Good. Let's go back up to the top. Okay. So, uh, what is an amateur, right? We've covered a lot of this. And I, and I realized kind of poorly that when I did the technician um, class license discussion, I didn't spend enough time kind of saying, what is a ham radio operator? What do we do? What are we all about? I just kind of assumed everybody knew. A lot of people already have their bow fangs, and they're like, hey, I'm into ham radios. I want to do the whole thing. Well, amateur, amateur radio, ham radio, is a service. It's a service that was developed in, in combination with the FCC, but it existed before that. And as this comment said, um, amateurs or operators were right there along with Marconi in the early part of the 20th century. They helped advance a state-of-the-art radio, television, digital communion, communications, and dozens of other wireless services since then right up to present day. Now, the book says there are 700,000 amateurs. It's gone up a lot and significantly a lot in the last couple of months. Um, thanks to a lot of people like you guys going on the Internet and finding out more information and getting your license. The problem is that a lot of people aren't taking the next step to go from technician to general. We talked about this. We've seen a huge kind of stagnant period where they get their technician. Maybe they keep it up to date, but a lot of people just let it lapse. They let it expire and they're, and they're done. So I'm doing this to kind of incentivize people to want to take the next step. So what is this next step? Well, it's HF radio. VHF radio, and, and this book does a good job of comparing and contrasting VHF radio with um, HF radio. And that's good. That's a good way to explain it. So amateurs that hold a technician class license communicate usually at a regional level using repeaters, right? It's a, you hold your radio, key it up. You're keying a repeater, usually on top of a mountain or some high place that's amplifying your signal, signal and sending it out uh, as well, as far as it can based off of the power that it can at the legal limit. That's how most technicians operate. They may even do a little bit of simplex. Uh, you can do single sideband, you can do satellites like we talked about, but the bread and butter, the meat and potatoes is technician class repeater work with VHF, handy talkies, maybe some mobile splashed in. I just got my general two days ago and missed the extra by two. Wow. Very good, Nick S. That's very good. That's further than I've done. I haven't even attempted the, uh, the extra yet. So... You understand what VHF UH is, hopefully, if you're watching this. Or if you just got your technician class license, I think you understand what you're getting into. You're getting into the use of VHF UHF radios for largely line-of-sight communications. It's not denigrating them at all. It's just, just saying what it is. We heard Jerry last week talk about the great stuff and the great distances he's been able to go 
using a very simple, not simple, but a, a five watt radio, his handy talkie VHF UHF, his, his Yesu, on a Slim Jim or a J pole antenna that he hooks up on his pole and he can get way out there, great distances. That's the kind of limit to it though. Once you get up high, that's about as best you can do unless you're gonna get into space, right? Unless you're gonna talk through a satellite. So with HF, you're opening the doors to not just greater distances, but greater access to frequencies. And that's this, this bullet here. General class license has access to a lot more space in which to enjoy amateur radio. And there's a figure in the book that, that I don't think I covered here, but it's the one if you go to the ARRL band plan or frequency allocations or license allocations. Um, exactly, Tom Garcia. I, I, don't, I don't think I coined that term, but I definitely use it. In my emergency MCOM videos, I refer to VHF, UHF as strategic radios, close comms, lots of close comms, all giving information, and then, no, I'm sorry, the other way around, tactical, <laughs> small group tactics. VHF, UHF, tactical, everybody's got a radio, everybody's talking, and that information is coming to a central hub, and then it's being dispersed via HF strategically to decision makers or people with resources to help bring stuff in. General gives best ROI of all three tests. There you go. Okay. So, where did my thing go? Did I not, did I miss an image? I did. I missed the reason for upgrading. See, that's when you do this fast. I, I came home, rushing home, and I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta get this stuff done. So, let me, let me go back a step and see if I can quickly. Oh, I know what happened. I think it's just out of order. Let me see. Nope, guess not. That's all right. We can just do it. We'll do it live. So this is that uh, band plan I was talking about. This covers all the frequencies that technicians, generals, and ex um, extras have access to. You should go download this regardless. It's on the ARL web ARRL website. But so you get access to more frequencies. You also get access to <laughs> highlighters you can't read. Uh, you get access to more communication options, which allows you to, I don't know, work HF, work modes like more CW modes, work more digital modes. Again, that's not to say you can't do that on VHF, UHF, but understand that everything you're going to be interfacing through is largely working FM. So if you're applying digital signal or CW signal into your Baofeng, you're just using FM to transmit that data. You're using that big FM bandwidth to transmit a little tiny bandwidth of digital. You don't need to do that with HF. You get new technical opportunities. With your privileges, you can start assembling and operating a station, meaning building your own kit building, which we've also done, I've definitely talked about. Um, you'll learn the effects of the ionosphere and the solar conditions, okay? Let's talk about that really quick. Why do you need to know that? Well, the way HF works is we are bouncing our RF across and against the ionosphere. That's what allows us to get such great distances covered with HF radio. We're literally bouncing our way between, you know, earth and, and the ground to get to where you're going. One, two hops. I think somebody can correct me in the, in the chat that knows better, but I believe there's up to like three or four hops. Could be wrong, but that's how you're getting that far. And then you, okay. So they put more fun. Um, more fun is one of the bullets with HF. So I've found that VHF UHF has similarities when it comes to like rag chewing and they mentioned rag chewing is like the first thing. I think there's a sort of kind of amazingly cool aspect of rag chewing with people that are across the country with a, with a large enough, powerful enough station. You could do that. You can meet every night on a given frequency and you could pretty much do that almost every day. Um, that's possible with HF. That's possible with rag chewing, etc. But you have DXing, which we've talked about, long distance communications for, for points and, and glamorousness and trying to work all countries, you know, that kind of stuff. There's a challenge aspect to HF, like people want to work all countries, somebody in every country. They want to work all of the great DX locations, like we mentioned Bouvet not too long ago in one of the live streams. You need HF to be able to do that, right? VHF, UHF, it's not going to cut it. Okay, so that was that. Okay, so general class license, as it says, mostly deals with new types of operating on HF bands. These are things that you, you probably haven't done yet with VHF, UHF. 
we are going to be using digital modes, which we've talked about, covered it on this. $20, man. The truth telling mofo. Thank you so much, buddy. You're awesome for making this. Like, oh, you got the crazy light going too. I have to go uh, into work. Laugh out loud. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much for making a general video. Yeah, and that's K E 8 H W D. And 72. Haha. -ha. 72 for which you'll experience in HF. 72 is the same as 73, but QRP operators get the same amount of done with less. Okay, that's what 72 means. It's just the same thing as 73, but it's the thing QRP guys send to each other because we can do it with less, right? Yeah, see? It's not a matter of how powerful your station is. It's how how you work it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, anyway, PSK31 is great. Long old video I made about PSK31, digital mode. The effects of HF propagation. So when we, here, I'll switch back, show this to you live. So that upper window right there where it says, you know, HF conditions, fair to good, good in the day, and, and or I'm sorry, fair in the day and good at night, um, that's for 80 through 40, 80 meters through 40. 30 through 10 is poor. That's because of the sun cycle. Sun goes through a 11-year cycle, and we're at a low. It's going to go back up, but we're, we're still in a low. So you pay attention to things like that. Particularly if you want to make some long distance contacts. If you want to make some long distance contacts, you really gotta, you really gotta focus on the sun. Uh, Franklin Lewis. So from time to time, I took the test on Tuesday when I call sign FCC database. Oh, with people talking about getting their, uh, getting their license. Lots of people getting their license. Again, um, if you go on the Hammerito crash course, you get a pretty good idea how fast um, people are getting their license. Some guy took a test and he had it in two days crazy and a lot of people it seems like they're all coming out on tuesdays the license so um i would check out the ham radio crash course on facebook so with with general you're going to spend a lot more time playing around with um tools instruments to perform and work on your radio uh, not just your radio but your antennas I have an antenna analyzer. Hey, thank you, Melon Popper. One dollar. One dollar it goes a long way. I appreciate it so much. I really do. Whoop! And there we got a got the party light. Um oscilloscopes for signals, uh antenna analyzers for you know, Jerry made his dipole antenna, right? Simple dipole antenna with speaker wire. Well, you can use an antenna analyzer to really tune that thing up just the light. You, you basically use the antenna analyzer, get it set to show you the SWR of the antenna, and then you just start like cutting the ends in until you're perfectly centered on the frequency that you want to be the most resonant. So if you're a single sideband guy, you cut it somewhere in the middle of the single sideband portion of general. And what I mean by that is, so if you take the frequency band, right, from the low to the high, usually the low portion is CW, and then the high portion of the CW frequency is digital and then the rest is usually single sideband now what do i mean by that well let's let's cut over to the radio again really quick so i'm uh i'm on 20 meters right now and i'm gonna go all the way down to the beginning of 20, 20 meters you know what is it dark out here no it's not dark yet so we're in cw We might not get a lot. We might not get anybody as there's people probably switching over to, because the sun's coming down on the west. So I'm gonna jump over to 80. Lots of noise. Oh, tons of action. You can already hear voices. I'm scrolling quickly, but. Put it into CW mode. There's CW in there. Booming. Okay. So there's CW. 3.500 is the low point. 
on 80 meters, and it goes up from there. Good CW coming in, and, and it's not dark here yet. I'm in the gray zone, gray time, where it's between day and night. Again, these are important things to remember for HF, going back to propagation right there in the upper right-hand corner. We're saying bat, fair is in the daytime, good at night. 80 meters is a good nighttime band. 40 meters is kind of an anytime band, but um, it's not great for propagation. Hey, there's Jerry. So another good, another good CW station. Hey, Salty's here too. What's up, guys? My two buddies from the YouTubes. Two YouTube creators right here. Oh, hey, Jerry, if you just hopped in, buddy. Um... Here's your new QRP radio. I found it. Runs off of a nine volt battery. You put your you put your antenna right there in the SMA, and then it's got a key right on top. Let me see if I can get this to focus. Why are you not focusing? Proudly made in the USA. <laughs> Look up uh, Quirky QRP. <laughs> quirky QRP. Thanks again for sending that radio. I, I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, but I know I'm going to do something. Okay. Uh, right there. You hear that? Mm -hmm. That's digital. That's a digital. Uh, that's FT8. I think that's FT8. So FT8, we talked about FT8 too. Remember, it works off of like 15 second bursts. So it's going to pause right now. Gone. Now, back. Okay. So digital, right? Getting up there in the CW. So let's jump over. Let's go to uh, lower sideband. So we're in CW right now. We want to hear people talk, though. So you got to go to lower sideband. See how the noise floor just went way up? It's too small to be a receiver and a transmitter. And uh, by the way, that plug on the top is for connecting your own key. I heard a gang of people talking. Very strong signal. So, I'm looking at my S meter here. This goes from 1 up until uh, 9, and then plus 20, plus 40, plus 60. He's an S5 to S7, and when he first started, it was an S7. These are all terms that are very important in HF. It means the strength, the received strength for the signal. When you make a contact with somebody, so for example, with this radio, I'm going to turn it down for a little bit. When I, when I made a uh, contact recently with this radio to someone in Minnesota, we exchanged our signal. And for uh, voice, it's two numbers. It's a one through five, five being le legible, good, easy to understand, five's the highest. And then you go through zero through 10 over 20 over 40 over, etc. Um, so he would be a five seven five because we could completely understand him and seven because that's the power that we were or the signal quality that we were receiving right so that's going to be a little bit later but since we saw an example of it i wanted to show exactly what it was tom garcia what are the most popular bands and bad segments for old school am rag chewing um i don't know about am but definitely the most rag chewing i've heard on 80 oh cool um a ad 6 dm dennis is doing the cw academy congratulations good for you um i did it i can't remember who the instructor is she was great anyway yeah awesome have fun with that 72 love me some yeah am is if you can get a, a nice receive quality am has a really good tone to it okay so that's that all right and then um last bullet on this slide let me go back to the slide so that i'm not losing everybody more types of antennas and again if you have this book tom garcia thank you buddy thank you buddy every dollar helps uh, we're on introduction 1-3 we're barely in the book we're barely getting started here 
They're kind of just, I'm, I'm throwing the line out and trying to hook the fish uh, to drag them into one to get their, their general. And if you're, if, you're, um, if you're seeing this as somebody who doesn't even have your technician yet, uh, my videos are already there. They're in the cards up at the top if you want to go do the technician class want to get your book, want to do that whole thing. Totally support that. At the same time, um, you're getting like an extra education if you can follow along what we're talking about here. Just keep in mind you're gonna have to you're gonna have to modify things a little bit when you talk technician. What would I recommend for homebrew? Homebrew what? Like homebrew antenna? Build yourself a dipole. Go build yourself a Jerry dipole um, KG6 HQD and and do it do it that way. Go get a fishing pole. Uh, one of those uh, extendable fiberglass fishing poles and build yourself a dipole that rhymes all right so let's let's get the practical stuff out of the way at the end of this you're gonna have to go take a test okay they said the test takes about 30 minutes meh uh see you later hunter from ma massachusetts right <laughs> take it easy man thanks for coming um it's about 30 minutes to an hour i don't know uh i you, your time will vary and it's not a rush you know, I've got two major rules when it comes to, to taking this. Of course, the, the testing location is going to close if you get there late, but whatever. Take your time with it. You don't have to answer the questions in order. This is just like multiple choice 101. Answer the questions you can answer very easily. Come back to the other ones. And then I've got a whole... I'll probably do that to wrap the whole thing up, the, this, this class we're going to do. The whole class, the whole series. Um, skip the ones you don't know. When you do those, when you do the easy ones, come back and then start to just cross out the ones you know are not possible. They're just not possible, so they're not the right answer. That'll get you down to like 50%. And then it's like a 50-50 coin flip, basically. And then you could probably suss it out at that point. And then, of course, my most favorite thing, favorite recommendation is go get yourself the app, the ARRL test app for, um, for the general, and then start taking the practice tests. If you get to the point that you're 75... Matt Ford, thank you so much, man. KF5, JRP. So this is good. This is really good. The people that I'm seeing in the chat, everybody seems to have their technician class license. I'm really glad. Oh, you got a long one. That $2 went far. <laughs> I'm really glad that there's a lot of technicians in here that are interested in upgrading. That makes me very happy because... That's been our big problem is getting people to want to upgrade to general. So awesome. Anyway, yeah, now I lost my total train of thought. Uh, start taking the practice test. When you get to the point that you're passing 75% of the time, schedule your class or schedule your test and go take the test. Uh, Franklin, on a plane 15 to 30 minutes, I took technician and general in 30 minutes. Oh, plan on. I thought you said on a plane. I'm thinking too fast. See, that's what happens. I start thinking too fast. I'm only at 7.30 and I'm already... I'm already going crazy. Um, uh, this is just to kind of reaffirm what we're talking about. Technician licensees focus their studies to develop operating skills for techniques for VHF and UHF, which are FM voice repeaters. As we mentioned, FM. Almost everything's FM. Very few 2-meter, 70-centimeter radios are HF. Aside from your 6-meter privileges. 6-meter is largely single sideband, um, and same with 10 meters. Okay. However, operating is similar to that so-called weak... Uh, on HF, however, operating is similar to that of the so-called weak signal modes. Modes on the lower portions of the VHF UHF band. Single sideband. Simplex, meaning no repeaters, nobody's amplifying signal. We're going one-to-one. -one. Long distance, one-to-one. -one. CW and digital modes are by the, for the most common used. As a technician, you may have some HF experience on 10 or 80, 40, 50 CW, number 10, you have more access, 80, 40, 15. Currently, you have only CW. We recently went through that whole thing with the ARRL asking the FCC to increase the license privileges to add voice and digital to 80, 40, 15, and others. I would be very happy to see that happen. So uh, anyway, as a technician, you may have some XDK. The general license opens up more frequencies, modes, and activities, which we've been talking about. Okay, so basic operation of an hf station right they do a good job of explaining it so i'm just going to kind of repeat what they're saying here hf is not channels it's not memory it's not um 
repeater on one frequency living in perpetuity or until the repeater owner changes the frequencies. There is none of that. It, it's, it's not a program thing. There is no repeater book. There's nothing you can query. There are uh, HF nets you can look up that have his historically been on a similar frequency. That's true. That's possible. But it's not hard and fast because of some hardware program that way. We all just showed, we all just went to that frequency and said, hey, we're going to talk here today or talk here every day for many years. So with that said, the way you look at all this, and, I, and I'll give you an example, HF radio was designed to be manipulated, right? So case in point, these guys are still rag chewing, but the biggest control on this radio, this little QRP radio, is this knob, this dial here. This is your VFO knob, variable frequency oscillator, as it's mentioned in the slides. Its job is to scroll through the frequency as I spin it. I may be going a little remedial for some of you guys, but it's still good to, for a lot of people to remember this. You're going to use this thing like a big jog dial. Tom Garcia keeps calling uh, KG6HQG the soda god. He is great. Can't wait to activate my first summit later. Josh and Jerry uh, will be responsible for thousands of dollars of purchase this year. Well, if that's the case, make sure you use my Amazon <laughs> link. I'd appreciate it. Uh, so you're going to scroll through, right? And, and look at what we're doing, right? We're on 3.830. I can use other controls like these arrow keys to either go up or down the frequency. So let's say I don't want to be on 8.8. .8. I want to be on 0.9. Still using the jog dial. Oh, and see, I jumped right into a QSO of some kind. And you can hear they're kind of... So they're on 929. You see how they're, like, you can hear them, they're, they're good. But if you hop back and forth, you can hear some kind of QRM, not disturbancing interference. Ready? Let's wait for him to talk. <laughs> We're off one. Ready? Boom. They're fine. Let me actually change my diaphragm on my microphone. Oh, no, I'm on circular. Good. Okay, so you should be able to hear that, hopefully. So the VFO knob is the big knob in the circle. It's usually the biggest control on the radio, and that's kind of what this slide is saying. That you're going to see, much like this radio, that this big honking knob, particularly on the desktops. Yeah, so um, good thing to remember... If you're planning on getting into HF radio and you want to get your own HF rig, it will uh, behoove you to go ahead and put hands on. You might want to think about maybe not buying a radio sight unseen on the internet as much as I would love you to use my Amazon link. You might want to go to a ham radio outlet, put hands on and feel that VFO knob. Case in point, the VFO knob on the Icon 7300 is buttery smooth and delicious. Um, I really like that knob. The knob in this slide, I, I don't really not like because of the knurling. But it does have that little buttonhole that you kind of put your finger in and spin it around. That's kind of cool. That That's nice. And actually, the um, the Zygu has these little nubbins uh, on the outer rim, which kind of gives you some traction when you roll. I like that. Anyway, that's the VFO. Important to important to know that. Uh, that's on page 212. Or we're in section 21. Does it not have page? Yeah, it doesn't have pages. Okay, so you're on your, your HF rig. Um this is primarily talking about single sideband, which is your voice. So you're on the VHF, UHS channels. We know how to call CQ, right? Is everybody called CQ? I hope everybody's called CQ unless they're predominantly only on repeaters. You call CQ, you say CQ, 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 usually three. This is blank, your call sign. And uh, you can use, so on uh, VHF, UHF, you're probably just going to say KI6NAZ. On HF, particularly when we're doing SODA, it's Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu, right? And and I actually default in saying it phonetically instead of it just the letters, just from calling CQ so much. And I do that just QRP in general. You're, you're probably going to find QRP in general. You're doing a lot of phonetics. 81 people watching right now. Thank you so much, guys. If you haven't already, please give me the thumbs up. I'd really appreciate that. Helps me, Helps me out. All right. So in CW, when you're doing that, you use the abbreviation DE, okay? This is, this is KI6NAZ. CQ, 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 DE, KI6NAZ and CW, okay? So then you've got CQDX, which is for, oop, 
You want to do that? <laughs> Wait. Oh, shoot. We're not on the slides. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm all just talking letters anyway. So, uh, CQDX, meaning distant stations, usually outside the CQ station area. CQ for stations operating in a contest. So sometimes they'll say CQ, their call sign, and then a contest, CQ, contest, CQ, contest, and then they'll say their call sign. CQ for stations of a certain area, CQ, Minnesota, uh, QSO party, Q, CQ, um, North, North Carolina, QSO party, etc. So you can kind of vary it, but CQ, CQ, I seek you, is the general thing. And I was calling CQ with the with the quirky, the quirky QRP earlier. That's what that was. Okay. So joining an ongoing QSO party or breaking in is also common. On phone, the customary procedure is to say your call sign during a pause in the conversation. Just your call sign, KI6NAZ. So people are talking. Usually in HF, people kind of give each other kind of a wide berth so that you can get enough time to go in there and respond or, or give the person enough time to whatever that, that has having to rag you. And you say... Ki six NAC. Now, sometimes they will break and let you in. Sometimes they won't, and it could be for a couple of reasons. One, the jerk reason is that they heard you, they don't care, and they don't want to hear you because they don't know who you are. That's possible. Uh, two, they just can't hear you. You hear them, but they can't hear you. Like in the case I'm playing with my QRP radio, happens a lot. Three, only one side of the conversation can hear you, and that's more often than not is that you will get one station very well and you won't get the other station so it's like you're listening to a one-sided phone conversation and in fact i don't know if there's any nets going on today but we may be able to find it at the end of the class here we'll try and jump around a little bit and see if we can find some one-sided conversations or just any kind of weird hf funny business um on cw you're going to send bk and that's break now I, if somebody's just doing like a, a, they're just doing a QSO for for making a contact, I wouldn't send break um, CW if they're doing a rag chew, and maybe you know the people or or maybe you're trying to get in because that's the way the conversation's going. You're gonna know better if you know CW what they're talking about anyway. So then you can send break. Sometimes you just don't. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, yeah. So they'll. If the, the break is accepted or your call sign is accepted as a break, somebody will say, go ahead, station, come on station, the breaking station, and then go ahead and do your thing. Um, identify yourself, call sign, etc. Now, this sometimes... Friends sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom Garcia is mentioning uh, HQD6, KG6 HQD. I just refer to him as HQD. I don't know why that, that sticks in my head. The, the back end of people's call signs are what I remember them by most often than not, so I don't know why. Anyway, when we did our activation, we had a guy, a contest station, who I think he could hear him, and I think he just continued to... Oh, 100 watts in a wire is going on right now? Oh, um, I'm able to hit them. It, I love lasers. If you know the, the frequencies, post them. I know they're 40 and 80. And in fact, that'd be hilarious because I was talking to the the purveyor of 100 Watts in a Wire on his podcast a couple weeks ago when he was talking about guns. Yeah, he and I had a little discussion. Good guy. Good guy. We just have difference of opinion on some things. Everybody kind of knows where I stand when it comes to guns. <laughs> um, yeah, so over break, uh, Roger are all still good lingo. We don't use the 10 the 10, uh, the 10, 10, four, 10, this, 10, that. We don't use that much anymore. Here's this, uh, don't be a lid or a douchebag operator. Yeah. Try to be nice. Even if you're, even if you're on a quote unquote dirty, um, if you frequent frequencies that have naughty, uh, rag chews, you can still be a, an okay operator, right? A lot of the guys who are dirty operators, quote unquote, they still are okay operators and don't just like mess with people at the same time there are a lot of people who are just garbage people that um that don't follow any protocol but you know those are jammers more than anything and jammers are kind of a way of life okay mm, i don't know well, well hold on let's see i've got the let's see if we can hear 100 watts in a wire yeah there's somebody there so that's about a two three two three two three two three.
Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jerry. Jerry's still there. <laughs> 725 is the 435 of HF. Those, that's the HF frequency, and that's a VHF uh, reference. Tom Garcia says, too many folks have strong transmitters and amplifiers better than the receivers and just walk over you. Your receiver should be as sensitive and your transmitter is strong. Uh, yes. So I would I would encourage everybody to have... Yeah, you can contact me on HF. You, you tell me the frequency and I'll hop over there if, you, if I can. I doubt I can. And I doubt you'll hear me because I'm only on 5 watts right now. But things are a-brewing. Things in that area are going to change soon. Um, so the rule, we'll go back to the golden rule of, of operation. You should only operate with as much power as it requires you to complete your contact. Now, having a sensitive receiver is a vital part of that. Very, very important that you have a, a sensitive receiver. So you got to have that. We got to make some moves here because we, we got to start moving through these slides a little bit faster. <laughs> I'm slowing down too much. Uh, selecting a frequency. So we, we covered this. I covered this. Jerry's covered this. You go onto a frequency and you say, hey, is there anybody on a frequency? Right? So, okay, actually, let me take a step back. Different frequencies are better at day and night, like we've said. Fair and good conditions at night or crap conditions during the day. Where are we? There's our slides. So you want to pick one that matches what you want to talk on. Short range, regional contacts, long contacts. 80 and 40 meters are a good choice. Longer range contacts are easier on higher frequencies, 30 through 10. 30, 20, 10. Why do a lot of people use 10 meters for soda? It's good in the daytime, and it's relatively long distance, right? So you kind of pick your tool for the job you want to get done, right? That's what we're trying to do here. Uh, you, do, 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 do. Yeah, so anyway, once you decide you pick one, you say, hey, is there anybody out there? CQ, or is this uh, frequency in use? Is this frequency in use? Is this frequency in use? And then they say no, and then you wait a minute, you start using it, and then they step all over you with their with their big, powerful uh, station. That's that's how that works. And then you move to another frequency after you made your uh, spot on, on Soda Goat. <laughs> okay, you simply have to wait until ongoing QSOs are over. Watch you guys hit Oklahoma with 100 watts. Uh, yeah, I didn't have it in mind, but I hit uh, Massachusetts with with five watts jerry's still awesome for doing it with um with 100 milliwatts that's awesome he had a uh, i don't know that guy he hit though that guy he hit had a pretty big pretty big ears on his on his station which big ears means really good at listening which goes back to really good receiving kind of the benchmark of good operators you find people who make a lot of contacts are because their station is very good at receiving it's a combination of a really good antenna and a really good radio more often than not it's a really good match of an antenna They've got their, their kinks all worked out in the antenna department. On HF, uh, it's perfectly clear channel is a rarity. There, So that's a good point. On HF, however, a perfectly clear channel is a rarity. There will always be some noise present, and the signals of other stations may occasionally be heard. So, ooh, somebody, okay, somebody wants to do on the end. Oh, okay, so we're going to hop over. Let's see if we can... Let me just finish this, though. Um, just because you can't hear the station doesn't mean that there aren't people talking and listening to another station that you can't hear. It's on the other side of the country or it's somewhere else. So if you start keying up on a frequency, just start having whatever it is you're doing, start yelling CQ, start doing whatever, and you haven't asked, hey, is this frequency open? You may be stepping on people listening at least to another station that you can't even get close to hearing. Maybe it's in Europe. Maybe it's wherever. So it's it's generally... It's generally nice to say, hey, is this frequency in use? And somebody will come back and say, yeah, we're doing a, a Europe DX. I actually had that when I did my, my failed soda activation. I was on a frequency that was being used. Um, I, sh I was on it, and there was nobody there. And I started calling CQ, and I got somebody that came back and said, hey, you might. You, there's another DX station that's on here, far off DX station. I couldn't hear anything, nothing, but anyway. Oh, thank you, DK David. Okay, I'm going to hop over. We're going to do a quick little uh, side thing here. 723456. Uh, oh, going the wrong way. 723456. Wait, is that right? 7234. Almost. I can count. And 5-6. I 
I don't know if you're calling. CQ, CQ, CQ. Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu. CQ. This would be the first HF uh, contact that we've been running. CQ, 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 Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu, CQ. And there might, sometimes those dips are, are chat going on. James, man, good to see you. I didn't know you were in there. Hey, thanks for watching. You're going to watch on the phone, but you, okay, got it. Hopping off a of chat, you're still going to watch. All right, appreciate that. Keeping the numbers up. I like that. I can hear you, buddy. Um, let's talk about that a little bit later. If it was a slam dunk, we could do a quick QSO, but um, I'm going to leave it at that for right now because we got we got slides. we got to move. we got to move through some slides. Okay. This is a good point. Whose frequency is it? It's nobody's frequency. We're all trying to operate in the same space together at the same time. Being cordial is important. Um, it mentions QRP. Hundreds of miles and QRP operators around the world is common on higher bands. While it's convenient to make one frequency a meeting place, don't expect it to be available all the time. That's a good point, too. There are call frequencies that you can look up on the Internet that will tell you on 40, this is the call frequency. What that means is everybody meets there, CQ, CQ, call sign, blah, 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 uh, talk to whomever, and they say, okay, cool, switch over to this. Switch over to this frequency, and then you can continue your discussion at that point. Hope this is all making sense. All right. So here's the here's the big thing that's different with um, VHF, UHF. Interference, right? HF frequencies are not channelized, as we already mentioned. So you get interference, meaning there's noise all over the place, and there's people making long-distance calls, these contacts, all over the place. It's not these short-working contacts, so interference all over, right? Important to note as well, we don't use squelch in HF. We use, um, we just leave it open and we just try and reduce our selectivity to the point that you can, you can hear the station or pick out who you're trying to get. So most interference is caused by signals from other hams. Uh, most interference caused by signals from other hams is incidental and not terribly disruptive, meaning whoops, bad, right? Accidental, or you're listening to one side of a QSO and they don't know you're there because they can't hear you like a QRP station. Once you gain some experience, it's easy to copy a desired signal through a little bit of QRM, which is interference. That's a Q code that's coming up later. So you might want to remember that. You may experience or even cause accidental interference when station begins transmitting on or very near a frequency that you're listening to. That uh, example I showed earlier when we were on 529 or something like that on, on 80. 530 was little garbill like stuff. It sounded like a Murloc from World of Warcraft. That's unintended QRM. That's you're trying to talk on 29, but you've bled over into 30 and, and 28. So voila, there you go. Now, now, the second <laughs> and more pernicious type of interference is malicious, deliberate, or willful interference. This is where the term lids came from. And it's specifically forbidden by the FCC rules. So that's a reality. There's going to be jerks everywhere. And when you add a, a, a splash of anonymity, people, they just, they run amok and they, and they act like jerks. Okay. If you get upset about it, it's, there's not much you can do. VHF, UHF is not hard to DF because you're within a relatively small sphere of influence. When it comes to DFing, direction finding a, a signal on HF, it, it gets way more difficult. In fact, um, there was a guy I was talking to. He took umbrance with the fact that I said that the FCC will come down on you. And they will. The problem with what the FCC does is that they levy fines. And there's no real jail time. People don't really get punished, quote unquote. The fines are ridiculous. You're like $10,000 to $25,000 for fines if you, if you create un unintentional interference. The problem is it gets wrapped up so deeply into the um, into the court system that it's very hard to, to police and control. So, yeah. Uh, another point is the best way to avoid interference is to be smart and use your knowledge of amateur service as an advantage. 
starting with reasonable expectations, learn what bands are crowded and when, and learn the characterizations of each band. So, case in point, weekends get crazy. There's always an event on the weekend. There's always a contest. There's always something somebody's doing. Sometimes it's a CW contest, which means the CW band's going to be tied up. Sometimes it's a digital contest. Sometimes it's single side band. Single side band's probably the craziest because it's just a ton of people out there just blah, 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 yelling. All right. So that's not bad. That can be fun, particularly if you haven't experienced a lot of it and kind of throw yourself in the middle of it and, and get, get into it. Now, uh, the modes, which... We've covered so many times. Amateurs use many different modes of communication. Yes. CW, continuous wave, Morse code as it's otherwise known. That's the lower ranges of the HF bands, which I kind of already talked about. And you're not supposed to do phone or digital signals there, data signals. Right? Makes sense. That's for CW. It's still alive and well, and you can still get a lot done with CW. I think we all, I don't have to repeat that over and over again because I think it's well understood. Right? Um, HF bands, CW can be trained. Okay, so this is a good point. It's often forgotten that CW can be transmitted anywhere on the HF bands. Case in point, whatever crystal, so there's a crystal inside this QRP mini keychain, and it operates on 1414750. That's pretty high uh, in, the, in the CW space of 20 meters, but it doesn't matter because CW can go anywhere within the band. Okay. Nevertheless, most CW operators tend to operate in the segments of the band reserved for CW uh, and data. Right. And that is kind of the more nice thing to do. Rex Voke, dropping in to say hi. Good vid, man. Thank you. Uh, Henry Bond, going to throw out some wire over my washing line. Quad loopish. Right on. Um, there's actually a whole series of really free uh, plans you can get just by Googling um, wire antennas. Plus, the AWR has a ton of books. Tons of books on, on wire antennas. Again, I'll make the comment before I go on. CW takes up a smaller bandwidth. We're going to talk about that. That's one of the reasons why it's so popular, particularly with QRP. AM and single sideband phone. So AM is reminiscent of AM radio. Works on the same principles. There's a major node or uh, lobe in the middle, the main lobe, the carrier lobe, and then two side lobes. Basically, they're like, hey, what if we just, just got rid of the carrier mode in the side, one of the side lobes and just use the lower or upper side band? That's why when we're tooling around on the radio and it says LSB, uh, lower side band. Upper side band, USB, right? So read through this really quick. On HF band, single side band is by far the most common voice mode and phone signal. Most new radios are single side band first and they're AM kind of as, a, as an extra feature. Plus, it also requires a lot more power to work AM. Oh, family zone. Close that door. Single sideband use uh, less. Single sideband uses less spectrum space in AM, and properly adjusted single sideband occupies about three kilohertz and AM twice as much, six kilohertz. In contrast to an AM signal, single sideband signals do not contain a carrier or the extra sideband lobe. Right, so. Um, even with those disadvantages, AM has a role to play in the amateur bands. AM transmitters tend to give warmer sound. I, I mentioned this earlier. AM's kind of a dying thing, although there are a lot of people who still use it. It's kind of fun from a vintage standpoint. A lot of the good receivers and transmitters are still tube based, and they are literally receiver transmitter. So they sound good. They sound like a nice old time radio if you've ever been able to hear that. And not like a faked old time radio with filters applied to it, like a good warm sounding AM radio if you've, if you've been so inclined. And it's, it's good if you haven't ever experienced that. Now, single sideband. Single sideband is the more popular mode, but which of the two sidebands is used? This is the important part. Because of technical considerations in early single sideband radio, amateur conversion or convention is to use upper sideband on frequencies 9 kilohertz that's 20 through 10 meter bands and lower, right? Um, so basically you use upper sideband on anything from 20 through 10 meters and you use lower sideband from uh, 20 through to 160, right? Whoa. So it's lower sideband for the, the further, the larger, right? The larger meter length and then upper sideband for 20 down all the way to six. 
<laughs> Digital modes. Okay. So, packet radio is used on VHF, UHF. It's what you use for um, APRS. It's what you use for the email systems, which some of you may have used as well. But digital modes are where, are where you're going to use your radio as the means of transmitting and receiving tones into your computer. And the computer is going to either decode those tones or create those tones and send them out. There's a world of devices that do that. I made a whole video on FT8 and uh, discuss Whisper a little bit. You can check out. I should put the links in the description so you can do that. And then image modes, right? So um, before I get off of this, digital is actually a complex thing. I should spend more time on digital as just a general thing. There are different kinds of digital. There are simple digital. There are uh, low power, high survivable digital, as I call it. And that's your uh, JT9. Whew, I'm getting that beer gassy. JT9, FT8. FT8's more of just a quick QSO digital mode. Um, JT9 is a little bit better for that. JT65. PSK31 is, is more like RIDI, radio teletype. It's it's just a one-to-one -one communication with very little error correcting. JT65 and JT9 and FT8 has a lot of error correcting. I think JT65 does. Anyway. So you can go from lots of error correction, which is very, it takes a long time, but you're going to get your message through to very low error correcting. And then that's what you're, that's what you're stuck with. So you pick the digital mode, much like you'd pick any, um, any other type of communication to make sure you're making your contact. So image modes are kind of like what we were doing with the ISS downloading or receiving the ISS station and then, um, displaying it you know in its parsed format same thing happens on hf there are frequencies that are unofficially allocated for doing a single slow scan television so a lot of people go there they use their computers again to interface with their radio and they're able to transmit these cool pictures sometimes it can be a little naughty so your uh your mileage will vary here's a great table okay Mode comparisons. We're focusing on the bandwidth column. CW is up to 150 hertz. Up to 150 hertz. Okay. Single sideband, 3 kilohertz. Okay. And then narrow bandwidth HF digital like RIDI, PSK31, JT65, and JT9, 500 hertz. So even the digital is more than twice as wide bandwidth as CW. So remember, CW can go further, can be higher fidelity than single sideband as put in the notes. So I, I'm not telling you you have to go learn CW. I'm just saying your life may be much richer if you do. <laughs> and if you've got the mind that can, that can do it. I'm reading the comments. I'm afraid I still love the tone of AM. I know it's power intensive. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Henry Bond. I, love, I too love the tone, real warm human tone, amplitude. So case in point, the um, the Zygu is a 5-watt radio that will do AM, but it only does it at 1.5 watts. So all that power is going to create the carrier tone and the other sideband. Uh, Henry Bond, good comment. Go down to the local radio store. They'll likely have secondhand rigs with warranties. Um, you should show that with your VFO. Tell the SV guys to do that. I'm not sure what the question was. I did show my VFO. I did. Uh, I agree. Secondhand store is the way to go if you can. Um, well, not a secondhand store, but secondhand uh, radio. So here's... Wait, what's going on? Did we jump around? <laughs> what happened? We lost something. Anyway. So basically, HF transceivers have a variety of controls to help minor minimize uh, interference. So this should have been earlier. So... Um, when you have VHF, UHF, you have really three things at your disposal. You have channel selection, squelch, and volume control. Those are your really only three things that you have when you're, when you're receiving. Um, you, can, you can elect to type in a, a simplex channel or frequency, but that's still kind of more of the same thing as a channel. You're still just typing in a frequency. With HF, though, you have a lot more things at your disposal. You've got notch filtering. You have a blended, just a myriad of different kinds of filters. Um, I have a couple of filters. I have high pass, low pass filters set on my on my Zegu, Zygu, 
Zaiju, as somebody called it a Zaiju recently. Okay, sure. So there's all kinds of different filters. Um, something that has di digital signal processing will have a lot of filters. SDRs, like Jerry's KX2, has a lot of filters. And what that does is it helps you reduce the noise and focus in on the station you're trying to, s to listen to. We talked about earlier, and we, and we had an example earlier, where we had that uh, station that had a, had a pretty strong signal, an S7, and then the two frequencies next to it were kind of blown out by his signal. Well, your radio can kind of get around that if, it's a, if it has a lot of selectivity. I Meaning you can kind of narrow down the bandwidth and focus directly on what on what you're trying to hear. A lot of radios will have like a CW filter installed. It could be physical or it could just be actually I'm I have the CW mode selected, which is a filter in its own right that reduces it down. And then I have a filter that takes it down to 0.5k or something like that, right? But if I want to do single sideband, that has to go up to 2.4k for filtering. Right? I hope that makes sense. We've already covered that the filters need to change because the size of the RF is different right? in the bandwidth space. CW is 500 hertz, meaning I can get away with a 0.5 uh, kilohertz uh, frequency filter. Hopefully that, hopefully that follows. Now, Q code. This is a, a thing you got to learn when you're operating too. There's lots of Q codes. We've already said one QRM, one that uh, soda people use a lot, QSL, meaning was that a copy? Did you get my my what I said, what I was talking about? Did that make sense to you? Well, usually it's like, uh, give me your signal. Give me your signal uh, report. You were a 5-5, five, 5-5, five, 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 and they come back. Did not copy. Uh, copy or say again, signal report. 5-5, five, 5-5, five, 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 QSL. And then they're like, oh, yeah, it's a copy. That's a 5-5 five, five, QSL, right? We don't use 10 code. We don't use 10-4. And this is, a, this is an interesting highlight at the bottom. Professional radio users have decided it's better to use plain speech for clarity and understanding. In fact, what will often happen is they'll use phonetics in a lot of cases. If they're spelling something out, they'll use phonetic alphabet. CQDX, 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 somebody posted. Depends on where you're at. I'm in California. What's your QTH, your home uh, location or your where your, where your station is? Oh, my gosh. I fear that the export of these slides got all jumbled because it's bringing CW when we were talking about modes back up. So we're out, of, we're out of pace here a little bit, but I think I covered most of this. I will mention this, though, because this is kind of important. Um, this is a straight key, right? A straight key is how fast dits and dots work is based off of how long I sit on the, on the key. A long dit and then a, or a long daw and then a dit makes sense or um using my little mini keychain how long i hold down this button makes a dollar or a dit paddles don't work that way paddle is the thing that's that's right there paddles iambic paddles the the left paddle when you push it in is a dit and if you hold it down it goes dit 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 and if you hold down the right it goes da 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 it's important to understand that that um rate in which it duplicates and creates dits and daws when held down is controlled by the keyer. And that keyer is the box that's to the left of the iambic key. That's what's controlling the speed of the dits and the daws when you hold down the, the two paddles. So, I don't know what that is. That's somewhere between 15 and 20 words a minute. That's controlled that way. So you need a keyer if you're going to use an iambic paddle unless you have a radio that supports it like the the Zygu does it. I believe the uh, KX2, of course, does it. KX3, of course, does it, too. CW, we've already covered that. Okay, emergency operations. So this is important. It's very important to me, and it's very important to some of the stuff I've done on the channel. I am a big proponent of being prepared for emergencies. That's a lot of the reasons why I do this radio stuff, because I feel it is so important for that. So providing service to the community is a significant factor in the decision of many people to become hams, and more importantly, to stay hams. We talked about tactical versus strategic comms. Tactical comms, we get out there and we give everybody FRS radios or everybody has bow fangs and they report in what they're finding. Maintaining good radio 
Um, etiquette, though, when doing it, do, being good operators, waiting their turn and, and providing information, unless it's a true emergency and somebody's dying, and then they say, you know, break, emergency communication, etc. So even if, this is an interesting point, even if you are not affected by the emergency or disaster directly, you may receive emergency communications from an amateur who is. Another case in point, I made a video about, oh, thank you, Glenn, uh, Glenn, is that Glandul Kid? Glandul Kid. You are doing more for ham radio than anyone. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I like to think that this information is out there. I, I don't, I, I'm not saying I'm doing it better than anybody, but I'm just out there doing it, and I appreciate you watching, so thank you. Um, had a guy in Iceland, I think, or Switzerland, one of the, the colder climate areas, started with a Baofeng and kind of got talking to a local radio club, got lost, Totally lost. Happened to have his Baofeng. Could not get cell reception where he was at. Called the radio club and they came and got him. He relayed this story to me after he programmed his Baofeng. I think using one of my videos. So amazing. That That's exactly the point. So you're out there. You got your radios on, whether it's VHF, UHF, or maybe both. Maybe you got a rig like mine, which I should talk about that. Um, this is very simple. This is going to get all put in a box one day. This is my new MFJ 4230 uh, DMP um, power. Um, what? What is it? <laughs> Why can't I not think of it? What is going on? It's a power box. A power supply. It says right on the side of it. It's a 30 amp switching power supply. Why I got it though is it has uh, Anderson power plugs on the back, so I can plug a lot of devices into it, or two devices, and you can plug switches into that. So. Uh, then next to that is my 2730, which you know about, and then below that is my Zygu. That's eventually going to get all built into an appropriate thing. Oh, thank you, Ellen. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's just the learning style. Maybe we're all just ADD, um, old, uh, either too old to be a millennial or maybe you are millennials, and this ADD style that I have is perfect for you. Yeah, power supply. Nice. Right, it's written right on the side of it. Why <laughs> did I know that? So this table is important. I think this is a really important table. FCC emergency, emergency communication rules. So these are the, the four or so sub areas that they qualify as an emergency when you don't need a license to operate. If you're operating during a disaster, a station in or within 72 kilometers, 50 nautical miles of Alaska may transmit emissions J3E, R3E on the channel 5.1675 megahertz assigned frequencies for emergency communications the channel must be shared with stations licensed in the alaskan private fixed service transmitter power must not exceed uh, 150 watt pep a station in or within alaska may transmit communication test okay alaska cold got it if you're in alaska no offense you might already know this safety of life and protection of property no pre no provision of these rules prevents the use by an amateur station of any means of radio communication at its disposal to provide essential communication needs in connection with the immediate safety of human life and immediate protection of property when normal communication systems are not available. In other words, when the S goes down and you're the only one around and nobody can make a communication, you are allowed to use any means necessary to get your contact out and to the appropriate party. So there you go. Station in distress. No provision of the rules prevents the use of an amateur station in distress of any means at its disposal by a tra attract attention to attract attention. Oh, sure. Make no its condition and location of attained assistance. No provision in these rules prevents use of a station in the exception circumstances described in paragraph A, the means of radio. So, in other words, you're basically allowed to do anything you want, again, when it's for a station in distress. And then lastly, Radio Amateur Civil Media uh, Emergency Service. No station may transmit in RACES unless it's an FCC licensed primary club or military reaction station. So I'm not going to go into depth on RACES or ARIES. ARIES is the equivalent ARRS version of RACES, which RACES is put on by, uh, operated by FEMA and governed with laws and regulations by the FCC. If you're interested in that, you can you can Google it. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of questions. If there is, we'll handle it when we start studying for the test. So I'm going to get this out of the way now. I want to thank you to the patrons. We got some more patrons um, in the producer category. Again, big thank you to Carrie 
Carrie Blackwell got her license. Congratulations, Carrie. I, I knew you would. I knew you could. Ben! Don't die out there. Michael Nieswander, thank you. Von Dubs, Jerry Hines, Jason Brown, Chris Ebert, Terry Hines, Danny Miller, and the Sieb guy. I think that's right. Sieb? Appreciate you guys, all of you. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so we got uh, the first chapter and second chapter out of the way. I respectfully, they are about operating HF. The, the nitty gritty of operating HF. So um, next up, I'm thinking it's going to be rules and regulations, but I might save that to the end because I think that that's just rote memorization. And me talking about rote memorization is not going to help really anybody. You're just going to have to get that done on your own. Um, I think we should focus. I think we should go math or components and circuits. Oh, Stephen e Eaton said, Aries is how I cut my teeth on amateur radio. Awesome. Um, that's a very admirable way a way to do it. I'm the Sieb guy. Hey, what's up, Jason Siebert? Oh, of course. I got it. I didn't know. Well, I'm assuming it was Sieb. Um, I did start working on some of the math because I figured out, yeah, I cut holes in all the papers. See that? That's highlighter. Uh, I figured that we're probably going to spend more time on components and circuits than anything. And that's where a lot of people are going to get get held up. I think we're going to do that. This isn't that This isn't that difficult. Radio signals and equipment. To me, I look back at this and I'm like, yeah, this is a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun when I learned when I went through this stuff. I forgot some of it, but you're going to learn a lot. <laughs> uh yes and no, you can communicate to anyone during emergencies. Pretty much um you so, gosh, um, I do know of a case actually that happened. In fact, it might have been. It might have been Zach who told me about it. It's either Zach or Hunter, that somebody was in New York and they were communicating to the police via their radio, kind of illegally. And even though I believe they did help save the life of that individual, I think they got a fine. I think they got in some kind of trouble for it. Uh, so you can get in big trouble. Um, so you got to be careful with that. Um, I'm going to take a couple of quick QAs, and then I'm going to hop over to Discord for a little bit as I wrap things up here. Um, if there are questions earlier in the chat, I was so focused on getting the slides out, I didn't catch your comments or questions, a lot of them. So if you have something that you've been waiting for me to answer, now would be a good time to repeat it. I didn't get through the entire, did I? This is the last of the seven. The seventh anniversary. It's good. The Grand Crew is way better. I, I plowed through that thing. This lasts me the whole show, which means I didn't totally love it. It's good, but didn't totally love it. And the Brew Crew, um, the reviews are updated on the Google link that is on the Patreon. So thank you. Come now with your questions, chat. 70 people watching. Hopefully you all gave me a thumbs up. Uh, a couple things while I'm waiting for questions. I'm gonna go ahead and question: Is that gun behind? Is that a gun behind? It? Yes, it's a water gun. I'm gonna go back over here. Where is my interwebs? I want a couple shout-outs to Ethan. Ethan, our admin over on Discord and the Ham Radio Crash Course, made this cool little Ham Radio Crash Course live stream. Great job. Thank you so much, buddy. As you see this, hopefully you see this. I really appreciate that. And he did a good job of updating it to say Thursday instead of Friday because we did this a little bit off off nominal. So I really appreciate um, him doing that. So thank you. So DJ Schnibs. All right. So here's my, here's my opinion on P.O. Box use. If you don't want people to know your address, get a P.O. Box. And do it before you get your license. Or do it before you uh, upgrade your license to general or do it before you refresh your license for the first time. You, um, what will happen is it will, the PO bot, whatever, whatever you give the FCC, it's going to display all your past addresses, but everything from the point that you give them the PO box, that's what's going to be. So you can move. So case in point, the addresses that I have are from where I, I used to live. 
I've moved, but you only see the PO box now, right? So the same thing would work if you got your tech and you gave them a PO, you gave them a real address, but then you moved and you gave them a PO box, then nobody knows where you're at. No, uh, Hawkeye, I don't think that MFJ 4230 DMP is on Amazon. I will look though. Ethan is responding to a question. First, first HF rig for general under $1,000. So I've gotten this question a lot, and I have to ask one follow-on question. Do you have an antenna? Because if you don't have an antenna, that's going to add up very quickly. $1,000 can get you a nice radio, and, and Ethan said it, a U7300. And, and U7300s are showing up for under $1,000. You're going to have to shop around a lot. Um, but a lot of people like the, the, the ASU 450D. The AC 450D is anywhere between four to six hundred dollars, and you'll have money left over for accessories, power supplies, like the one you're going to need, and uh, and an antenna. So I don't know if you were planning on antenna ending uh, antenna ending it up. I don't know why my my two cameras my two scenes have different camera angles wire in the trees is fine but do you want to put a thousand dollar radio on a wire in the trees maybe not maybe you'd like to get a more permanent mass set up or maybe a hex beam a lot of people are talking about hex beams now on these days a hex beam i'm even thinking about a hex beam you got a hex beam with a tripod uh, mounted on your roof with a rotator that'll be five hundred dollars five six hundred dollars they can, they can be more expensive, but... Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to make your own antenna, there are options, but the best option seems like the way the world's going, which is all SDR. So I would go with the 7300. I bombed controlling club net call in as I went cheap and didn't add a load resistor to my PC power supply. Have one coming on slow boat from China. <laughs> Sorry about that, man. Okay. All right. So I think I'm going to end it there. I think I'm going to end it there. Did that station uh, earlier, the operator, did I get... A response on if he was trying to transmit to me I know I was trying to call CQ but nobody responded uh, I yeah so don't ship what you buy from take it easy Jerry don't ship what you buy from Amazon to a PO box ship it to your house if you if you can some people can't because they get robbed I only put things I get from YouTube, like the QRP keychain guy. He sent it to my P.O. box. Like, my P.O. box is on the internet. You can get that anywhere if you want to send me stuff. But that's, I use that for the FCC. Oh, I love that question. Tom Garcia, besides coffee and granola bar, what food or beverages do you take on your soda hikes? Do you use dehydrated survival food? Yes, I do. I take uh, probably too much water. And largely that's because I drink coffee and I sometimes eat a meal. Usually Mountain House, the Mountain House, what do they call an Extreme, where it's just one serving and it's really packed down tight. Um, I have a, my favorite is Chili Mac. Chili Mac with a, a nice hot sauce is one of my preferred things out on the trail. I do have to say I'm also very uh, happy when I have a biscuits and gravy. Biscuits and gravy dehydrated is actually really damn good for some reason. I don't know. It's better than it should be. I'll tell you that much. Uh, wasn't sure if I was capable of... Oh, good. Ethan is a great guy. Uh, Ethan is very active on the Ham Radio Crash Course. He's probably answers questions faster than I do now. And he's really good at helping people out. So if you're not a member, you should be. He's an admin there as well. Um, MREs are great, but MREs are heavy. So... A lot of people strip down their MREs. They'll they'll take out a lot of the accessory packs. They'll obviously, get rid of the plastic and the cardboard, and they'll just take the meals. The meal pouches aren't bad though. Only problem with the meal pouches is you kind of have to boil them to get them hot, versus just applying boiling water to a food that's like air light. Not that I intended on pissing someone off, but I don't want some angry ham knocking on my door. Well, they're still gonna knock on your door if they DF you, All right? 
but yes, that's fine. I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't worry that much about it. The uh, good thing about MREs is that they have a uh, a really long shelf life. But they're heavy. Still, they're heavy. You you do have to factor that weight in. I'd rather have so. It's kind of an interesting thought. I never really thought about it. Sometimes I'd rather have the water out of the food and in the water bottle and not already in the food that you're carrying around as weight. Because I always have the uh, the option of not eating the food, just carrying the freeze-dried, very lightweight meal back down the mountain with me, which which I did with Jerry. We didn't actually eat food. In fact, I had... Um, there's a bar that I had that my wife got that I, I thought I would hate it. I really liked it. I'm just glad she got it. It's like four four egg whites, a date, and peanuts. It's this really bland, generic-looking package. I love that thing. It was really good. So it's high in protein, not a lot of filler, not a lot of garbage. That was perfect. Love that thing. Uh, TS440. Well, let's look at let's look at that. TS440. Is that a a server? <laughs> No, it's a Kenwood, of course. Oh, yeah, that's a classic. You can get those pretty much anywhere. Uh, I do have a food dehydrator. I've never thought about making my own my own stuff. A dehydrator is not the same thing as freeze-dried. Freeze-dried is very different. The key is to wrap, F them, or strip out all... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'm going to go with the Screaming Babies, pretty much the sign that this is over. I do have one more thing to show, and again, this is a big shout-out to, to Ethan. He made this for me. He took my Baofeng um, picture, and he made Baofeng Man, the, the new comic, coming to you soon. I don't know when, but why not? Just a, just a guy, I imagined a guy with, like, a, a instead of a, a T-shirt cannon, he had a cannon that just fired Baofeng radios at people. And then right before they knock out, like they, you'd get the Baofeng at the last moment, like hit them, and it'd land in their hand. And right before they knocked out, they'd hear like frequency mode, but it would be in Chinese, and then they'd, they'd go out. Or they'd hear me like, time, time to become a silent key. I just, just came up with that. <laughs> time to become a silent key. Anyway, I'm going to hop over to Discord right now, at least for a little bit. I got some stuff to do on the house side. All right, guys. That's it. Thank you so much for watching. Appreciate everybody there. Take it easy. Post your questions in the comments or hop over to the Ham Radio Crash Course and do them there or hop into the Discord and get them answered right now. Okay, guys? Take it easy. See ya.